Hallelujah. It's Sunday. It's a day of gathering together in the name of Jesus. We're going to exalt and lift him up. Amen. Let's stand on our feet and sing. Hallelujah. God is good. Glory. Let the people of the Lord stand and sing this song. Glory to God, hallelujah. We'll shout it out loud, let faith stand strong. Glory to God, hallelujah. As the children of God, we're going to shout and sing. We'll praise the name of Jesus as our King of Kings. In Him we're forgiven, yes, we've been redeemed. Glory to God, hallelujah. Glory to God. Gosh, what a way to start the day. I sure am glad you're all here. What a blessing. There's no place better to be than right here today at this minute and moment in time. We are in a wonderful season where the Lord is moving us, literally moving us, right? 
fantastic. Um, oh, my gosh. We put so much effort and time into this place, and it's been such an amazing blessing. And now God says, I'm going to bless you with some more. An abundance, an abundance. And one of the things that we're going to need, every one of these chairs is sanctified. This is a part of, part of this church, part of God. And we're going to need help after the service picking these chairs up and stacking them back in what used to be the kids' room in the back. And so I please ask all of you able-bodied, you're all able-bodied. <laughs> uh, no, I ask everyone that can please help to help so we can get these chairs stacked after church. And then there's going to be a lot to do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday, containers, uh, shipping containers coming. We're going to need to move stuff in. Before that, we're going to need to get all this moved out of here. God's calling his workers. That's us, folks. He's calling the workers to step up. Now is the time, right? Please, please come. We are going to have a sign-up sheet um, after service. And asking you, you've made a commitment to the Lord. Make a commitment to be here at a time to help out, right? I know for a lot of us, we like to just say, yeah, I'll be there. And then something else comes up. No, this is first. Seek the kingdom of God. Part of this body, we should be, ah, we just, we need your help. Be here. Be here. I'm just I'm asking you. Um, also, in the back, in the front, as you go through the double doors going this way into the back where we eat, in the front, those few tables there and things in the front, um, the, foos, the foosball and all that stuff, there's giveaway. So if there's things that you would like, please feel free. Take them. Also, the bookshelf over here, if there's some books you would like or books that you have, please feel free. Okay? Um, <sighs> kingdom of heaven is at hand, and now is the time for us to rise up. And so I just, I am so full of fire and just ready. I, I can't wait for pastor's word, but uh, this is a, a last day here. Let's raise the ceiling off. We don't care. God will cover the damage costs. Let's just raise the ceiling in the Holy Spirit today. All right. Love all of you. Thank you for being here. And now, Les. Well, Gerald asked me to bring a short word, and I'll get to that word eventually. <laughs> I've been reading a book by John G. Lake. Some of you have heard of him. I'd recommend that you look him up if you don't know of him. There's a word that uh, has never gotten into my being until just lately as I was reading, and that's stigmata. And in Christian tradition, these are marks corresponding to those left on Jesus' body by the crucifixion. They're said to have been impressed by divine favor on the bodies of St. Francis of Assisi and others. And this book I'm reading now from, by John Lake is called Heavenly Authority, and this is a quote from that. There is such a thing in the world as stigmata. That is, contemplating something so much contemplating something so much that it actually becomes a fact of your own being. Now think about what the word says about itself. It is well explained by telling an incident from the life of St. Francis who had contemplated the cross of Christ with such intensity and it so moved him that he said to his father, follower, when I am dead, open my body and you will find the impress of the cross of Christ on my heart. And sure enough, after his death, when they opened his body, there was the impression of the cross of Christ on his heart. There is an inner life, an inworking of God. It has to do with contemplating something so much that it becomes a fact. Along with that goes Proverbs 18:21. I think it is, that says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. What you speak is what you're gonna get. Everything we see, touch, feel, hear, out here was created by the Word of God. He spoke it into being, and He has imparted that same power to us by His presence of the Holy Spirit in us. But this isn't by osmosis, folks. It's not by osmosis. You don't just turn it on at night and come up in the morning knowing it and living it. 
Romans 12, 2 from the New Living Translation says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. By changing the way you think. Then <clears throat> you will know what God wants you to do. And you will know how good and pleasing and perfect His will really is. Look at Psalm 119 sometime. 176 verses broken into 22 segments of eight verses each, one for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. But in those 176 verses, the Word is referred to all but five times, all but five verses. The Word in some way. Statutes, precepts, commandments, testimonies, ways, judgments, the Word, all but five verses of the 176 refer to the Word of God. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought, every thought, into captivity to the obedience of Christ, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Years ago, as I was in school, I was working, driving bus, and it was about 20 miles from Grand Forks out of the Air Force Base, and I was privileged to be driving the bus that day. I had one passenger come in from the base, a lady, <clears throat> one passenger on that bus, and we got to talk, and she was Catholic. And everything I said to her in arguing or trying to explain against something of the Catholic faith, she had an answer for until I quoted the word, until I quoted the fact that God tore that veil in two from top to bottom, something a team of horses couldn't do. He tore it in two from top to bottom indicating that we have direct access to God through the Holy Spirit. We don't have to go to or through anybody. And it was quiet from there on in to, the, to town. That's all there was. <clears throat> Jesus did this same thing in the wilderness. Three times Satan came against him with the word. It was a part of the word. It wasn't the whole thing. And Jesus countered with the word, with a rhema word. <coughs> Excuse me. We've talked about rhema many times here. Rhema is that rifle shot thing. It's specific. It's to the point. It's for something now today. Logos, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God. The Logos was God. That's the whole bit. That's everything that you get here. But the rhema word, contrast to the logos, logos, I say, is a shotgun. The rhema is specific. It's to the point. And Jesus used this in the wilderness. And if you look at Ephesians 6, 13 and following, it talks about putting on the armor of God. Do you know that every one of those pieces of armor is based in the word? There isn't a one of them that doesn't have its foundation in the Word. Girded your waist with truth. I am the Logos. I am the way, the truth, and the life, said Jesus. The breastplate of righteousness. Where does our righteousness come from? From the Word, from the Logos, from Jesus Himself. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the peace of God. You will have peace as you've never known it before. The shield of faith. And faith, we know, comes by hearing and hearing by the rhema of God. It's the rhema of God. It's not just looking out here and seeing everything that God made. Faith comes by recognizing what the Word says, the rhema, that specific word to you at this time for the purpose that you have for it now. It's the rhema of God with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. And this is that short word. 
Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of, O-F, the faith of Jesus. By grace are you saved through faith. And that faith is not of yourself. It's the gift of God. It's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. One little word, of. And then Ephesians goes on to say, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word, again, the rhema of God. And folks, you don't get that rhema once on Sunday morning. You get it by dwelling in the Word constantly, casting down imaginations and every high thing which exalts, exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ. And furthermore, just a little about the Word. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God-breathed. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And by the way, I was supposed to start this out by telling you this is an exhortation. According to 1 Corinthians 14, it's an exhortation. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit of the joints of marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And further in <clears throat> Ezekiel 36, 26, it's like unto Jeremiah 31, 33. I like 30, Ezekiel 36, 26. It says, I will give you a new heart with new and right desires. And I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony heart of sin and give you a new obedient heart. And I will put my spirit in you so you will obey my laws and do whatever I command. He's done that in the Holy Spirit. Just like a newborn babe, when you accept Jesus Christ, that Holy Spirit comes in and he gives you an instinct into what is in his word. You may not know it mentally yet. You may not have it in your heart except through the Holy Spirit, but it's there. And if you don't squelch it, if you don't quench it, if you don't lie to it, if you don't push it aside, it will bubble up and it will grow and it will come alive <clears throat> as you read the Word. He will do that. He does do that. But again, it's the faith of Jesus on which we operate. You're going to hear more of the word this morning through Pastor Gerald. Listen up. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. That's for sure. You're definitely going to hear some more word. And that's all I got is lots of word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. This day of gathering together at the feet of Jesus, at your throne of grace. Father, where your mercy just flows out in an abundance. Father, because of your great love for mankind, because of your great love for your creation. And all of this that Jesus did was so that mankind, your creation, your love of man so that man that was lost could come back to the favor of God, come back in and, and just reside with you and have fellowship with you. That is your heart's desire. And Father, I just pray today that's our, our heart desire as well, to always be in your presence, always seeking your essence, to know that you are there. If you come to a stop, I want to bump into you. Yeah. That's how close I want to be with you every day of my life until that precious moment when you tell your son to go bring your children home. And Father, we know that those days are rapidly approaching. So as the word is spoken today, Father, I pray there will be ears that will be wise to listen and listen closely because the trumpet sound is coming. 
Father, we bless you and we thank you for this great time of gathering in the precious name of Jesus. It's in his, play, in his name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, let's stand and sing, shall we? Sandy, she's picking on her guitar. Notice the big smile on her face. We're writing new words to old school melodies. Well, there ain't no doubt that God's been good to me. Oh, the sun is shining on down to you and me. Right now, I'm where I want to be. Never felt so long, so peaceful, and so free. There ain't no doubt that God's been good to me Cause he put me smack dab in the middle of paradise In the heart of a family where my dreams have come alive Everything I have and everything I need Just another reminder God's been good to me Broken road, been long times, lost my way. I've been down some dark and deep tours, leaning heavy on my faith. But where the devil had me chained, the good Lord set me free. Hallelujah! Oh, hallelujah! God's been good to me. Cause he put me smack dab in the middle of paradise. In the heart of a family where my dreams are come alive. Everything I have and everything I need Just another reminder God's been good to me Cause he put me smack down in the middle of paradise In the heart of a family where my dreams have come alive Everything I have and everything I need Just another reminder God's been good to me they put me smack down in the middle of paradise In the heart of a family where my dreams have come alive Everything I have and everything I need There's another reminder God's been good to me Oh, another reminder My God's been good to me Yes, another reminder God's been good to me to us. Amen. Even in times like this, when we see all heck breaking loose, God is good all the time. And all the time, amen. And he'll never leave nor forsake because why? He's your Lord. He's your Redeemer, your Savior. Amen.
song and lift you up and magnify your holy name for you are You may be you may be seated. I'm going to do something a little bit different this morning. I can do that. Not only am I the worship leader, I'm the pastor. Um, let's see here. I got this new song I want to sing for you. It's it's one you've uh, you've probably heard on radio, and uh, but I, I I thought it would be a great song. And Sharon has a special coming up right behind mine that speaks of God's joy. You know, it says uh, that we've been talking about in James chapter 1, it says that to count it all joy. To count it all joy. No matter what our situation, no matter what's going on around us, we can count it all joy. And you are not, and when I say you, I'm talking to Satan and his little buddies. They will not, they will not, Rob me or steal my joy. Amen. There's revival and it's spread like a wildfire. Come on, Gerald, get it right. I had no problem at practice. 
I guess I've been talking too much. There's a wild rock. Okay, let's do it. Ah, oh, get up higher. There you go. <laughs> There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Oh, won't you choose it? Well, you can't lose it. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I've got an old soul, crying in my soul. Got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I got a heart overflowing cause I've been restored. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. When the valleys that I wander turn to mountains that I can't climb. Oh, you are with me. You never leave me. Oh, there ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I got a heart overflowing cause I've been there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. Oh, 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 clap your hands and soft your feet till you feel that God can feel. It's all you'll ever need, all you'll ever need. Clap your hands and stomp your feet till you it's all you'll ever need, all you'll ever need. I got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I got a heart overflowing cause I've been there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy Yeah! Amen Amen there ain't nothing. The only time he can steal your joy is if you let him. Amen. Well, you know, um, many of you have been praying over my wife and some of the things. And we have other people. Um, Pastor Debbie and Sharon is out. and I mean, there, there's people that are being under attack. And I am rebuking this in the name of Jesus. Because there is such a such a joy that is going through this this body right now because of the understanding that God is doing a new thing. Um, I am really, really, and I hope you are along with me, I am really excited about this move. I love this place. Uh, there was a lot of good, strong, foundational beginnings in this place. But I'm looking forward to see what God has next. Um, I, I got to share this, and I'll, I'll share a little bit of it later on. I, I had a vision this morning, and uh, I'm, I'm going to share something with you. Gather up a bunch of blankets and start storing them up. Because God gave me a vision that we have 120 chairs up there, plus what chairs we'll bring with us. But he told me, he says, you better pack up a bunch of blankets. And then he gave me a vision of over 1,000 people wow. laying on the floor. Hallelujah. Not sitting in chairs, laying on the floor and worshiping God because they need joy. They need peace. They need understanding of what's going on in times such as this. And they're lost. They're in panic. 
Don't let them rob your joy. And there again, be a joyful noise for the Lord in everything we do. Okay, Sharon. I'm looking forward to this. Well, I heard you say your way isn't quite clear. And it gets hard at times to persevere. You say your burden's hard. Well, don't ever doubt that God is in control, working it out. Count it all, oh joy. This trial you're in. God is just working. this next verse he'll never allow more on you than you can bear but we just gotta run to him and have faith and he'll And like I said, I've been under attack all week, and uh, I am this morning again, but he will not. I said he will not rob me of my joy. He will not take my joy away because I love what I do, and uh, I love sharing the word, and I was blessed this week to uh, have that opportunity as many of you know, we've had the poster up. It's been online uh, about the uh, cowboy camp meeting that was held over at the Indian Creek Steakhouse in Caldwell. What an awesome time we've had. It's been a full week of just 
the glory of God coming down and just just filling people with overflowing. We had people that uh, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, began speaking with new tongues. We, we watched healings take place. I mean, every, God was every place in that room. In every life, he was operating, he was moving. And I just thank God that I was blessed to be a part of that. And, uh, and I shared there on Friday morning a, a message of these last days. And as you already know, um, God has been putting this on my heart for a very long time. I have shared with all you that my heart is very heavy um, with the, the spiritual sense of knowing these last days are very, very short. And that uh, many of the church are asleep. Um, and I, I'm going to say some things that might be offensive, but I can tell you this. Hear my words and then get over yourself. Because what I say is on my heart and it's in the word of God. And God is saying the day approaches very rapidly. You've heard me say this. Our bridegroom cometh. He's coming back. Uh, the other night we heard Pastor Bo speak of the kingdom of God out of uh, Matthew 6, 33. And then we heard Kenny speak on it, and then I added it in. And I mean, the kingdom of God is at hand, and we are that kingdom. We are the kingdom of God. But understanding that our position in Christ Jesus is to be an active part of God's kingdom, not just saved. Uh, one of the things that was talked about was the fact that it, the... Um, the parable of the ten virgins, and you've heard me share that. And that you can take that word virgin out and just put Christian. Uh, and it would still mean the same. Because there's no difference. What it is, it says that they are pure and they have been uh, selected. And they are a part of what Christ, our bridegroom, is looking for. He's looking for a bride. He's coming for a bride. The reason for that parable is that there is a division or there is a understanding of this bride that he's coming for. It's a bride that is adorning herself with the word of God, is preparing herself for her bridegroom, not just taking up fire insurance. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is, is that if we're not seeking after the kingdom, if we're not seeking after the things of God, if we're not doing what God has put us here to do, as we read in John chapter 17, the prayer of Jesus, he says, Father, don't take them out of here. You've put me here, and I have put them here for a specific purpose, and that is to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It is to go out and share the gospel. It is also, as I've shared with you in Mark 19, uh, 16, uh, where Jesus says, And these signs shall follow those that believe. Notice there's nothing in there about apostles, disciples, evangelists, pastors, teachers. It says, Those who believe, these signs shall follow. And you've heard me say this many a times. Does the world see us for who we truly are? Do they see Christ in us, the hope of glory? Or do they see people that are doomed and gloomed and sick and broke? Because why would they want your Jesus? They're that way without him. And so what are we doing? As the bride of Christ, are we preparing ourselves for his return? The title of my message today, continuing on with this, is The Kingdom Life. This is a promise. This is a promise from God. All the blessings of God are yes and amen. All his promises are yes. His promises are yes. But you've got to know what his promises are. And doing that, we have to seek in. We have, we have to step in. We need to take this word, and that's why I said about the, the ten virgins, 
Five had their oils, their, their oil trimmed, and they had plenty of oil. The other five came with their lamp, but no oil. What is Jesus referring to here when it comes to the oil? As believers, we know that oil is the anointing. This is the same anointing that came upon Jesus when he came up out of the Jordan River after being baptized by John the Baptist. It's the anointing of God that came on him. His last name, as many say, is Christ. It's not his last name. Christ means anointed. He is the anointed one of God. And you are anointed in Christ Jesus. You are filled. But at the same time, if we're not filling our, ourselves and, and seeking after his righteousness and, and continuing to press into him, then what happens is, is that we run out of oil. And not only do we run out of oil, but we start falling asleep because he's taken so long to get here. I've been listening to this for since I was knee-high to a grasshopper. I, as you all know, I was raised in church. I was a New Year's baby. Yeah, they even have a picture somewhere of me in a diaper. With a ribbon over here that says, Happy New Year, baby. Because I was the first baby born in New Year's, on New Year's, so praise God. Uh, so I've been around for a long time. But under all that teaching, I never really realized how important I am to the kingdom of God. I was born again. I was saved. I had salvation. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior at the age of 10 years old. I was baptized. I have a certificate. But that certificate doesn't mean anything if I'm not living the life that he's called me to live. If I'm not seeking after the kingdom, seeking after. what I'm here for a purpose, and that's to worship God. I'm here for a purpose, and that is to take the, the promises of God, live them and put them into my life and live them, and then share them with the world so they can see Christ in me. We have a lot of people out there right now that are hurting. We have a lot of people in this church that are hurting. And yet it says, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus said, and these signs shall follow those who believe. Oh, any believers in here? Well, let's see the signs. Let's see the signs of your faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the power of his resurrection. He said, and these things you shall do, and greater things, because I go to be with the Father. Look with me at, at uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 22. And it says, let us draw near with a true heart. Did you get it? You know me when it comes to words. There are certain words that just reach out and grab my spirit in a, in a powerful way. And I have to research what is he saying. What is the Apostle Paul, I believe, is the writer of Hebrews. What is he saying? Let us, those of us who believe, draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. See, you can't go at this halfway. It doesn't work halfway. Because if we can't believe that God saved us for a reason, that God sent his son to the cross, and through that we have these powers and authority that are upon us, we are created in his likeness. Everything he did, we do. We speak things into existence by the movement of our mouth. Uh, Pastor Les this morning re read that. You know, watch what you say. You know, I don't usually preach this, but that's what I love about speaking in tongues. You know why I love speaking in tongues? Because Satan has no idea what I'm saying. If I don't know, he don't know. And he can't use it against me. But the power of the Spirit, speaking in the Spirit, he takes, the Holy Spirit takes those words 
and he turns around and he presents them to God as a sweet aroma. He understands exactly what's on my heart. He knows exactly what I'm saying. But Satan can't hold it against me. And I'm building barriers is what I'm doing. Because he has to operate in the natural. Even though he's spirit, he acts in the natural. He takes what is natural to, for you and I and uses it against us. We see this happening. There is an outright war. There's an outright war going on right now. And you are the center of attention. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This pure water is the washing of the word over and over and over and over again and again. And I know it's not always the easiest thing to do is sit down and take time and read your Bible. Let me tell you, if you don't, you're going to be deceived. You're being deceived right now. Jumping ahead in my notes. You know how long it would take for the Antichrist to take over the earth? 30 days. You go, well, how do you know that? We just lived through it. Huh? We just went through it. We're still going through it. They still have us locked down. They still have us quarantined. Many of churches, their doors are shut. And those that are open can only gather in small groups. And whatever you do, don't praise any work, don't sing any worship songs. Don't praise God. You'll spittle. Hey, there's nobody sitting here in the front row. I got news for you. When I spittle, it's anointing. Amen. But this is so true. He has robbed us of our joy. He is taking our joy away from us, and we're walking in fear. What if? Hey, what if? Who cares? What if? I know what the promises are God. See, if I turn around and I look at the world and the system of the world, all I get is what if, what if, what if, what if. And then when you listen to the answers, they're here today, gone tomorrow. They got another remedy. They got another understanding. They got a different total. In. Oh, we're getting away from it. Oh, now we got to go back to it. Shutting down. But not once, not once. Did they shut down the pot houses? Did they shut down the whiskey houses? Did they shut down the abortion clinics? But they sure shut down the church of God. And that to me is sickening. Now, you all know we shut our doors for a couple of weeks. But that came down from above as far as being understanding of the unknown and we need to do what our president asked us to do. But from this point on, and from the two weeks that we were shut down, from that point on, it's over, baby. It's over, because I already know it's all a lie. You say, well, how do you know it's a lie? It's not from God. It's got to be from Satan. It has to be from the wickedness of this world. And my Bible tells me that I can stand against the wickedness of this world. That I have power and authority in the word of God and in the, in the blood of Jesus Christ to stand up and speak to that enemy. You have no place in my home. You have no place in my family. And I rebuke it. It's not happening. Plead the blood of Jesus. You know what happens when you plead the blood of Jesus over your house, over your dwelling, over your body? Come on, you're going to tell me Satan has access? Ain't hey, no way. If that's true, then the blood of Christ has no effect. Ooh, glory. Hallelujah. Matthew 6, 33. Do not turn there. You know it. You could quote it. You hear it almost every Sunday out of one of our mouths. Because it's a, it's a part of Scripture that is Jesus speaking. It's Jesus speaking to us. And he says, seek ye first. 
Did you hear that? First, not second, third, or last. You've heard me share this before, and I shared it on, on Friday when I, was, when I was speaking to the group. And I said, you know, have you ever been asked by the church that you're going to and stuff that we have this special little thing we're going to do, and we're going to collect canned goods and give it to the poor and give it to the needy and, uh, or clothes, and, you know, if you have clothes and stuff like that. Have you ever noticed that even church people, these these people that have been blessed by Almighty God, they go to their pantry and they open up the door and they look back on the back shelf and they pull this all away. Because see, all the good stuff's up here in front. See, the things I love, they're right here in front. Because I'm always replacing them. But I go back here to the back and I push this all away and see the things that I really don't desire or are really not appealing to me, oh, I have no problem giving those away. I won't even think about it. Why? Because I won't miss them. They don't mean anything to me. Is that what Jesus Christ did for you and I at the cross? Did he send his second best, his third best, his fourth best? No, he sent his best. His only begotten son, God sent to the cross. You and I are to live in this kingdom of Jesus Christ, this kingdom of God. It means God reign. The reign, it's where God reigns. Not you, not me. It's where God reigns. And we walk in and we say underneath that anointed umbrella of Jesus Christ, and we do the things that he asks us to do, no matter what it is, do it. He'll supply your needs. He'll take care of your needs. He'll do everything that is necessary for you before you ever get to that place of saying yes. He'll already have them in place. I'm not worried about moving. I'm not worried about leaving this building. I've shared with you already that God gave me a vision of things to come. When it's going to happen, I have no idea. I already know it's going to happen. But what is it going to take to make that that vision come to a fruition. Faith in God. Doing what God is calling us to do. To go out and when you stop and pump gas and there's somebody sitting in the island next to you pumping gas, ask if you can pray for them. Get rid of your chicken stuff. Start being the people of God called to be a bride of Christ, the one he's coming after, the one that anoints herself with, with the word of God, that washes, washes themselves daily with the word of God, and then takes that word of God and doesn't hoard it, doesn't hold on to it, goes out and shares it with the world, with everybody. I'm not a Walmart shopper. I was, but I'm not anymore. I'm not a Costco shopper. But whatever store I go in, I have made a commitment to God Almighty that I will open my mouth and ask that person in line next to me, do they need prayer? Do you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? We're going through tough times in this world, and you need a king. And I know the perfect one. He's not a mute. He's not an idol that is mute, that can't speak. His name's not Buddha. Buddha doesn't speak. His name is not... Uh, Muhammad, who doesn't also speak. They're all mute. We have a God that speaks and speaks through his people. Oh, man. You, uh, did you hear that? He speaks through us. Why he would want to, I don't know. He's all power. He's all knowing. He can do whatever he wants to do. But he chooses to work through us. What a privilege. Well, I don't know, you know. Uh, I, I, I'm not as learned as you. And can I remind you of a man named Saul who became Paul? He claimed he wasn't learned, but I know he was learned in the law. But when it comes to the um, knowledge of Jesus Christ, he spent time with Jesus. Three years to be exact. And then he began his ministry. And the knowledge that he got out of being in the presence of Jesus Christ. And you have the same opportunity as I do or anybody else to spend time with Jesus. But we choose to be so stuck up in our world 
in our everyday life. See, we need to understand that everything that we're going through, it, you ever bought a new truck or a car? And you sit in that new car and you drive it home for the first time. And, oh, it smells so good. And you get in it the second, third time, you know, and you open that door. Oh, man, it smells so good. You know, and everything works so perfect. What about a year later? Huh? Is the smell is as good as it was the first day you got in it? Why? Because it's all, all falling apart. It's all starting to, it's no longer new. It no longer has this new smell. But every day is new in Jesus Christ. He does not stay stale. He does not, it's not just a temporal thing with Jesus Christ. It's a fulfillment of our life with Jesus Christ. It is an opportunity for us to fulfill the promises of God through our, us, the body of Christ. Let's read on. It says, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Watch this, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Everybody knows what Hebrews 11.1 1 says. Turn there real quick. It's only a page over. Look at verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things what? Hope for. And the ev for the evidence of things not seen. So it's not seen. We have the hope in Jesus Christ. How many of us were there on the day that he was crucified? How many of us were there on the day that he rose up out of the grave? Well, how do you know he did? Huh? By faith. I had an encounter with God, with the Spirit of God, and I realized I needed a Savior, and Jesus was him. And what he did for me, that he suffered and died for me. I think it was, I, I think it was Les that was talking this morning about the, uh, the scars. Uh, for those that were at Melody's thing last night, uh, she's had several encounters of going to heaven and actually walking with Jesus. And she shares that the, the, the nail holes are still in his hands. And there's like a, a gold um, aura, I'm going to call it, around each one of those prints. And there's also a, a, around his head where he was, where the thorns were. And upon his body where he was beaten, beaten so badly that flesh was ripped off of him. There is a aura over his body to remind us what he did for us. It's just, it's just amazing. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Abraham was fully convinced and fully persuaded. This is, this is something that I always talk about when it comes to Abraham, and I, I don't want to ever make it that Abraham is my idol, but at the same time, what I recognize about a Abraham is Abraham did not have the Spirit of God living in him. We do. And yet, here's this man, Abraham, who's walking with God. He had a, uh, a personal relationship with God. I believe he is one of those that if God stopped all of a sudden, he'd bump into him. That's what I want to be. I want to be that kind of man, so close to God, if all of a sudden he stops, I'm going to bump into him. Because I'm following him that close. But this man Abraham, it was by faith, because he had an encounter with God. He had a personal relationship with God. He walked with God. Just as Abram, as uh, Adam did in the garden, he walked with God in the cool of the day. That's the relationship that God intended for you and I to have from the very beginning of time, to walk with God on a daily basis in the cool of the evening, in the cool of the morning. Anytime we want to, he is there, and we walk and we abide with him, and we stand in his presence. We still can because of what Jesus Christ did at the cross. And because of this faith, it was accounted to him as righteousness. That's why God could say to him, I promise you these things. We have a covenant, you and I. And you're going to be the father of many nations. 
We all know that he talked about, well, how can I be a father if I have no son? Legitimate question. He says, don't worry about it. I'll give you a son. Well, how can this be? I'm uh, of old age. My wife is, she's pretty old too. But we know that nothing is impossible with God, amen? If we have faith and we trust in God, because what happened? He promised Abraham. He said, you will be the father of many nations. Your children and your heirs would, be, would outnumber the numbers of stars in the sky. And yet turned around, and God said to him one day, I want you to take your only son, Isaac, and I want you to take him to a place where I will show you, and I want you to sacrifice your only son. Now, we all know the story, but can you stop and think about all this that was going through Abraham's mind and yet at the same time he remembered the most important thing of all I have a covenant with almighty God I have a covenant with him and my God will complete everything he said and everything he promised so he had no problem taking his son and going to that hill and putting up the the, uh, the, the sacrifice and and everything, and ready to drive the, the, uh, the, the knife down. But prior to that, do you remember all of his words, what he said to the men that were back with a donkey? Just hang out here, guys. We'll be back. Huh? And then he said to his son, his son says, well, I see the altar. I see the fire. I see all this. But I don't see the sacrifice. What was Abraham's answer? God will supply. Why? It's called faith. I have a covenant with Almighty God. You and I have an even better covenant with Almighty God. We have a covenant through His sacrificed Son. His only begotten Son is the one sacrificed so that you and I could have eternal life, that you and I could have a relationship with Almighty God. Let's talk to this morning about that veil. There was a veil that separated man. Do you remember back in the garden? When Adam and Eve walked with God, but after they sinned, what happened? They went and hid themselves. Why? Because they were naked. And God said to them, who told you you were naked? I asked God that one night, how did they know? Because his Shekinah glory left them. And when the Shekinah glory, the glory of Almighty God came off of them, all of a sudden their nakedness was revealed. Their fleshness. But prior to that, they were washed in the glory of God. They were clothed in the glory of God. You and I are clothed in the glory of God. So why do we walk around like we're, we're, we're beaten? Why do we walk around like we, we're, we're not everything that God promised us to be? Maybe it's because we don't understand what we've been promised. And if that's the case, I'm going to start preaching on promises. I want you to know that, there every, that God has a promise for each and every one of us. And God will fulfill his promise. Don't be deceived by this deceiver. Remember, he only comes for one reason. He's a liar. He's a thief and a murderer. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what he's doing right now. He is destroying this nation with such a, a, a fierce movement right now that even the body of Christ shakes. That tears my guts out. Literally. As I've shared with you and I've shared with over this week is the fact that I have such a heavy, heavy, heavy concern for the body of Christ. They are so deceived. And it's called fear. First Timothy, one, Second Timothy 1.7 what does it say? What's it say about fear? And that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but what? Of power. Don't forget the first word. Power. Love. And a sound mind. Focus on the things of God. Focus on the promise of God. We have a blood covenant with God Almighty. We have a blood covenant with Jesus Christ, who is Satan in the midst of him. Jesus, as Les said this morning, what did Jesus do? 
He didn't stand up and go, dude, you know who I am? Well, of course he knew who he was. But how did Jesus respond to him? By the word. That's the only thing that can stop Satan and his demons, is the word of God. How much of the word do we have already in us and ready for battle? In days such as this, these last days, and trust me, they're going to get worse. He did not leave us here to walk in fear or in lack. A very important word that the church needs to understand, that we have no lack because his promises are true. And he is our provider. He provides all our needs according to his riches and glory. Hebrews 10, well, I already read three. Oh, here's one that goes right along it. We are not, the, um, it says there, hold fast, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, all right? For he has promised, he who has promised is, is, uh, is faithful, no matter what we see or hear in the natural world. No matter what you see going on, we are not to be moved. How many of us, be honest with yourself, don't raise your hand, don't speak out. Be honest with yourself, how many of you are moved by the spirit of fear when you hear the TV today and what's going on and how our world will be infected for the next several months? Just be honest with yourself. If you have that in you, you need to spend time in the Word and in prayer and let the Word of God wash over you and cleanse that all out because our God is faithful. He is more powerful than Satan could ever even imagine to be. He only has access to your life when you give him access. That's the only time. Understand that. He only has access when we give him access. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, We don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. Huh? It's easy to see the things that are seen. We see it. We hear it. It's right there in front of us, plastered all over the screen. We can walk out. How many here want to go uh, spend some time in Portland this weekend? Huh? How about New York? Everybody, all oh, everybody wants to go to New York, especially young people. How many want to go now? And yet we see that evil taking place. And what are what what is what are, what are people doing to to put a stop to it, to put an end to it? These last days, you and I. One of the things that Melody shared last night is is that. Um, God revealed to her that these days were coming. Only he revealed it to her 15 years ago. But then as she has moved and, and went back a few times more since then, it wasn't just, I believe she said just a few weeks ago, she had another encounter with God, and he says, beware, it's now. And he said, the time is, is now for all this to take place that there's going to be a plague that is going to come on this earth like nothing anyone has ever seen before. And that there's going, to be a, there's going to be a fall at Wall Street. There is going to be a fall of our financial um, uh, things that are coming. And we see it already. But he says, do not fear. Huh? Doesn't mean you go uh, stack up on the, gun, on the ammo if you, want, if you want to stock up on something, stock up on the Word of God. That will never fail you. Will never run out of, your, of, out of stock. Amen? Amen. So there again, we fix our gaze on the things that we cannot see. And that's the things of God. We, st we stick with what we know is true. For the things we see now will soon be gone. It's all gone. It's like that new truck. It smells good, it looks good, but pretty soon it's just another truck because you parked it too many times in the Walmart parking lot and everybody and his brother threw them carts right at your brand new truck. Yeah, I parked it way out in the back. It don't matter, them carts find them. Well, look at verse 24. 
And let us consider one another in order to, watch this, watch this, in order to stir up love and good works. Huh? Let us consider one another. We're talking about the gathering together. And the world says, no. Stay apart. Stay separated. We need to protect you from yourself and your spittle. We are here to protect you. And yet my Bible tells me we're to gather together. Do not forsake the assembly of togetherness, of coming together. Why? Because we're called the body of Christ for a reason. We come to edify one another. We're called to come here on Sunday. Not to rodeos, not to golf tournaments, not to football games. We're called as the body of Christ to come together. If we haven't got time in our weekly, in our, our life, to take one day a week and dedicate it to God, shame on us. Uh, I'm not allowed to say that. That's condemnation. Condemnation. But think about it. And yet we turn around and we sit here and we go, okay, wait for Jesus to come back. Remember the story. Remember the parable. Five were made themselves ready. Revelation 19, 7 says that the bridegroom is coming for his bride who is making herself ready for her bridegroom. She's going to be clothed in white linen preparing herself for her bridegroom. Five are preparing, are making themselves ready day in, day out, day in, day out doing the works of Christ, doing the things my bridegroom come. I want it when when Jesus comes, how will he find me? Will I be asleep? Or will I be preparing myself for his return? Because we know according to that parable, and Jesus does not lie, the word of God does not lie, says they were all of the same kind. They were all virgins. Five made themselves ready and five five ran out of oil. They fell asleep. And then they heard the news that the bridegroom comes, and they go to the other, uh, other virgins or Christians, and they say, hey, give us some of your oil so we'll have some. And they said, no. Wisely, they said, no, you're on your own. What if he tarries a little longer? I have prepared for this moment. You go buy. And off they went. And guess what happened while they were off buying oil? Doesn't matter what time, the day or night. When Jesus comes, when the Father says come, he's coming. Are we ready for his coming? Because he's coming for a church, a bride. And I hate to tell you this. We may not all qualify. Because we're worried about what's going on in the world. We're worried about other things. We don't have enough time. I told you I was going to be bold. We don't have time for God. But I got my fire insurance. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you know what? I'm going to tell you, those other five that were asleep and ran out of oil, yes, their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But when the bridegroom showed up, he took the five that had prepared themselves for him and he went inside and he closed the door because there was a bridal time a marriage of the lamb the marriage feast of the lamb was about to take place and it was taking place with those who had prepared themselves for his return now here's the goodness of our God you're not cut off. This is the goodness of our God. See, when you look at the things of this world, they'll just flat cut you off. You're out of here. You're of no use to us. Uh, what was it Hillary called us? Apporables. Yeah, that's a good one too. Yeah. Well, what does God say? No, you're, you're so important to me. And yes, you did accept my son, but you did not do what you were required to do. 
but you got a second chance. And we all know the mishaps of that missing that call. It's called the tribulation. And am, am I trying to scare you? No. But I am trying to warn you. When I see what is going on in the church today here in America, when we watch across the, the world itself and watch Christians being martyred, being killed, beheaded for their faith in Jesus Christ, and we walk around like pumpkin pie and whipped cream, Bible tells us there's a time of suffering. Got it? In fact, let me let me let me show you some stuff here. Um, go to Second Timothy. Chapter three. <clears throat> You're gonna find out throughout the writings of Paul here to brother Timothy who was a, a, a young minister that he is going to explain to Timothy that there is a time you know being a pastor and being called by God to to minister to people and every, it's not always joyful there are hard times with this job and as Jesus or as uh, Paul is going to explain to Timothy there is also a call on you to suffer. Oh, man, we don't want to do that. We're Americans. We live in the land of the free. And we don't have to, we don't have to make those kind of sacrifices. I mean, Jesus, Jesus made the final sacrifice. There's, I don't have to. No, I don't have to sacrifice. Look at uh, verse 1 of chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. It says, but now, but know this, that in the last day perilous times will come. For men, now, remember, Paul plus all the apostles totally 100% believed that Jesus was coming back in their day. If you read their writings, if you listen to their, to their letters, they believed he was coming back, especially Paul. Watch this. Know this, that in these last days, perilous times will. Not might. It will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control. Watch this last part here. Tell me if any of you have seen any of this happen brutal despisers of good. Huh? Oh, not here in America. What's wrong with these idiots? This is what the Word of God says. And this was written by Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to his um, uh, follower, Timothy. And he's telling that this is coming. Um, where was I? Brutal despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form, oh, oh watch this now, having a form of God in us, but de denying its power. And from such people, turn away. How do you know? How do you know just because they wear a black mask? Well, guess what? Nowadays, everybody's wearing masks. I'm sure glad I don't work in a grocery store. Especially in the state of Idaho, everybody packs. So it's nothing to see somebody come in with a gun on their side, but we normally don't see people with masks. If we see somebody with a mask, what is he? A robber. But now, they all wear masks. Of course, I love it when I watch them driving down the road in their own car. I'm going, really, God? <coughs> Who are being persecuted and killed for their faith in Jesus Christ? This is happening around our world. And it's going to happen here. Are you prepared? Or will it be a 
time of, well, you know, God, you didn't tell me I was going to have to go through this. So how do I get out of it? I'll tell you how you get out of it. Don't abide by the law of God, by the word of God. Just do what sounds good, looks good, feels good, and see how. How many of you, oh, man, I hate to do this. How many of you have watched one of the baseball games? I love baseball. And my wife and I turned on the Dodgers and the Giants game. We had it recorded. And the, at, unfortunately, it went to the beginning during the national anthem. And my stomach just crawled. But you know why they do it? To be with the in crowd. Money. See, they're advertisers that advertise or promote these players that spend millions of dollars on advertisement with this man's face on the picture. He better kneel. Or they'll cast him out. That's what I'm saying to us. Are we going to kneel or are we going to stand? It's time for the people of God to stand and stand and stand and win the victory because you're going to win. I don't care if it costs you your life. I told you about the word I got from God. I had no idea what this meant, and I really still don't. But no matter what it means, I'm ready for it. When he asked me, he says, are you ready to go underground? In America? Come on. Really? We can't have church no more? We can't gather together and worship God? That's just the beginning. This is what he was telling uh, Timothy. It says, here Paul is preparing Timothy for what is going to happen. I'm preparing you for what's coming. I'm preparing you for what's going to happen. It's going to happen. The Bible says so. Paul is in prison, and he is calling P uh, Timothy to suffer with him as a good soldier of Christ. Wow. To suffer with him. In John 17, Jesus is praying, I have given them your word. Verse 14. I've given them your word, and the world hated, has hated them because they are not of this world. Did you hear me? This is Jesus speaking. Go there, John 17. You all know where it's at. The Bible probably will automatically flip open there. Starting in verse 14. Remember, this is, this is the prayer of Jesus. Um, this is, in my humble opinion, this is the Lord's Prayer. We all call the other one the Lord's Prayer where Jesus teaches his disciples pray like this, our Father who art in heaven. Good prayer. But watch the prayer of our Lord. As he speaks of himself, then he speaks of his disciples at that time, and then he includes you and I. You are not, we are not left out. Verse 14, I have given them your word, and the world, the world has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. If I was one of those ball players, there's no way these knees are touching the ground. Not because of what they want. The only way these knees are touching the ground is to glorify my Savior, Jesus Christ. Because my Bible tells me that all knees will bow. There's a day coming when they will bow. But what they'll recognize, that is Jesus, and he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And they will have no choice. Right now, they have a choice. But on that day, no choice. You do not enter into the glory of God and see the Son of God and not fall on your face. Verse 15. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Underline, highlight, put it in parentheses, write it on your refrigerator, write it on your bathroom doors. Those are doors you open all the time. 
They're always in front of your eyes. Put them there. Understand that it says that he has given us his word. And then he turns around and he says, but keep them from the evil one. Now this is Jesus talking to dad. To almighty God. I've given them your word. I pray they will hold on to this word and become strengthened and purified and made even stronger because of the world or because of the word. And this world will have no effect on them. To keep them from the evil one, that they, not of the world, just as they are not of this world, just as I am not of the world. In other words, what Jesus is saying here, you are not common. You know what common is? Those guys that are bowing down to Black Lives Matter. And have no, it has nothing to do with black people. It has nothing to do with slavery. It has to do with our nation as a nation founded on the principles of God. It's all about our nation founded on those godly principles and they are going to destroy everything about it. They are going to wipe out our Constitution. Hang on to your guns, because they're coming. They're coming after. They're coming after everything that is right, everything that is good, and they're going to strip us of it. If God's people sit back and do nothing, rather than stand up for what is right. I am a Christian. You know, the Bible says that if you are, if any man uh, is ashamed of me and will not proclaim me, I will not proclaim you before my Father in heaven. I don't think about that. That's, that's some hard stuff. You deny me, and I'll deny you. We're living in a world where you're going to have to make a choice. We, as the body of Christ, are going to have to make a choice. You think you're going to shut my doors? I will go underground. That's what I think God was revealing to me. And when it came to this building, he say, he, 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 I believe what he was telling me, because that's where I got this answer. And I'm going, what do you mean by that? He even went and asked my wife. I said, Did, what do you think this means? When we're under somebody else's control, we have a contract with these people. It's called a lease agreement, but it's still a contract. Okay? And they can force us to do certain things and not do certain things because of their position as owners. Or they could immediately give us five minutes to get the heck out of this building. I believe that's what God was revealing to me. Don't be under someone else's control. And then, of course, you all know that uh, we went up there to the high desert station and went in there um, and talked to the lady. And she says, well, I get $2,800 a day for my facility. And right away I went, oh, four days a month. Well, I'm almost back where I was at the other place. She says, but seeing how you are a 50. 5013C I can write it off so I won't charge you anything huh? see that's having faith in God now as I shared with you if God told me to write the check to these people because I needed to bless them or we as a church needed to bless these people I would have written the check and I know Deb would She'd have stood with me. We'd write the check. And if God told us to double it, we'd double it. Why? Because God told us to. Who's our supplier? He is. See, if you're still living in the world system, then the world is your supplier. But when you understand who you are in Christ Jesus and what God has done for us, we turn around and we understand that we have favor with Almighty God. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to just do whatever. No. We're going to spend time in prayer. We're going to spend time in fasting. 
And I wanted to start teaching our people here at Sanctuary Calvary Church how important it is to fast. If you have a decision with your family, with your wife, with your finances, you need to learn how to fast. It's called suffering. It's called sacrifice. Well, oh, now wait a minute. I don't. I, you know, I, I, why should I have to do that? I know the promises of God. Really? Well, if you know the Word of God, then you also know that there's a sacrifice, and that's what fasting is. It's a taking the time, whether it's one meal or whether it's whether it's forty days. Jesus did it. I can do it. Praise God. He hasn't asked me to go that far yet. but I've gone 18 days. And the more you do it, the easier it is. Huh? Okay. And no, I'm not talking about diet. Because if that's how you do fasting, you're going to gain weight. Because it's not a true fast. Anyway, where was I? So you are not uncommon. L- not common. You are uncommon. You are not of this world is what verse 16 says there. It then turned around to 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word. Get it? Your word. It's the word. It's the washing of the word that sanctifies us. Jesus says, in the beginning was the... John 1.1. 1, 1. Who's the word? Jesus is. So we wash ourselves and we sanctify ourselves. This is part of what we do. See, it's through the word. He says, I have given them your word. He is saying to God, I've done what you've asked me to do. I brought them the word. And then God turns around and says, and he says back there, and I can't tell you exactly where it is, but he says, and that he will put his word in us. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. See, this is the difference between you and I and Abraham. Abraham walked by faith in the presence of God. If God said it, I do it, period. If I have to stick a knife in my son's heart, I'll do it. If I have to let the blood of my only begotten son fall out on the sacrifice, let it be. Why? Because my... My blood covenant with God Almighty will mean that God is going to raise him up from the dead in order to fulfill his promise. God does not lie. And now he's taken his Holy Spirit and placed him inside each of every one of us. If we go back to James 1, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, all you have to do is ask. And I will give it to you liberally. It don't come in little drops, teases. He opens up the floodgates. But see, we have to seek in order to find. Amen? Uh, Look at the... I know, I'm taking time here. Let's go back to 2 Timothy. It's a good Bible study. See? And look at chapter 2. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. And I want just to show you... Here again, remember this is this is Apostle Paul talking to Timothy, preparing him for the um, the field ministry that he's stepping into. Um, chapter two, verse one: You therefore, my son, be strong in grace, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, that unmerited, unearned favor, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's all yours. Huh? Don't forget that. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ so he's talking about suffering he's telling he's telling uh, uh, Timothy here you must enter into this place of suffering along with me It doesn't mean that Jesus, that God is, is whipping us or punishing us. We're going to go through hard times. In this life, you will have trials and tribulations, sufferings. 
but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And we all know that's Jesus speaking to you and I, right? Amen? You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged, watch this, watch this. Do we have engagers here? No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Oh, man, that's some heavy word. What do we do? We get so caught up in our everyday life and the problems we have and the things we got to do, we must do, we have to do. If I don't get this done, all hell's going to break loose. And I'm so entangled in this. And then we turn around and we get into a position where all of a sudden we get this bad news from a doctor. And right away we start focusing on the sickness. We have just forgot the healer. And this is the things of Satan. This is what he does. He gets us entangled into our life situations, and we take our eyes off of Jesus Christ. We take our eyes off of the Word when we should be digging into the Word. Into the word. And let that Word wash over. And what does it say? We read it there in chapter 3. Let it sanctify them. Wash them. Cleanse them. Just overtake them. Ooh, glory. Uh, where was I? Anyway, verse 4. No one entangled in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him. That him is small, that's you and I, who uh, uh, enlisted him as a soldier, or in this case, Paul. Also, uh, if anyone com competes in athletics, here again, you know this is Paul. He had a real thing about athletics. He is not crown crowned unless he completes uh, competes according to the rules. Oh, there's rules. You know, when you go to play baseball, there's certain rules. When you go to play basketball or soccer or whatever, there's always rules, right? Well, this life has rules. And God has given us a set of rules. And are we going to follow the rules? Or are we going to be so caught up in everyday life that we don't even care about the rules? And we have no way, way to compete or be uh, receive our, our crown. It says he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Do I need to read that again? Huh? He is not crowned. What is a crown? Victory. I finished my race. He is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I said, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. That's the gospel of Paul. You've heard me teach that constantly. You'll find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. You must believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and three days later rose again. That is the gospel of Paul. That is what he was instructed to teach and share in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice it doesn't say anything about repent and be baptized. It says you must believe that he is and that he did what he said he did. And then he rose again from the grave. And now we know he sits on the right hand of the Father interceding for you and I. Amen? Um, according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. Highlight it. The word of God is not chained. Satan cannot chain the word of God. But if we don't understand what is our rightful position in Christ Jesus, he can chain you. He can chain me. Because I don't know who I am in Christ Jesus. I don't understand all my promises. I don't understand everything that God has already provided for me to run this race, to finish this race. And then to hear the words 
from our Heavenly Father, well done, my good and faithful servant. Praise God. Amen? Matthew 8, 28, the story of Jesus coming into, well, I'm not even going to worry about that one. Um, Hebrews 11, one, or Hebrews 1, go there real quick. I'm going to finish here, I know. <clears throat> oh, by the way, new rules. We're moving. Amen? So we can set up new rules. Um, the rule has always been, if you have some place to be, and it's running into your time, get up and go. But as long as I've been led by the Holy Spirit to share what I'm sharing today and days in the future, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to be limited by a time clock. God is not limited by a time clock. And there's been, as we know, as we read in our history, there was many a times in our the development of our country that people went to church and they were there all day long. They came to worship. And that's another thing that I'd really like to get into and, and open up. Uh, you know, in the morning here at 9.30, between 9.30 and 9.45, we open this place up for a time of prayer. Um, can I be bold and say very few of you take that opportunity? Just think about it. If we, we can't get here together and pray over our church, pray for people here, or in, in mostly cases the way us uh, preachers, uh, pastors uh, pray in the morning, is that reveal to us in the spirit someone that's hurting, someone that has issues someone we can love on, someone we can talk to, someone that you will give us word for. I pray that as we go into this new place, because I'm expecting, I'm expecting God's people to be ready to work, to be ready to suffer, to be ready to give of their time for, for the call of Jesus Christ. Because if you wanna, if you wanna get to these, these lost people that don't understand, you're gonna have to give up time. You're going to have to make it a point in your life to open your mouth and say, Jesus loves you, and so do I. Can I pray for you? And the majority of the time, you're going to find that most people will say, absolutely. And if you're really lucky, they'll turn around and say, well, I've never accepted Jesus Christ. Well, come on down. You know, carry, carry some of our cards and say, hey, Put your name on it. Put your phone number on the back. Hey, if you ever need prayer, call me. I'll pray with you. I mean, you want to reach somebody? You want to touch somebody's life? Give me your phone number. Oh, no. Not my phone. You don't know, Gerald, how many phone calls I get. Yes, I do. I got one, too. If you give me your card and you give me your number, make sure you put their name in your phone. So it doesn't come unlisted or unknown caller. Because you gave me your number, so you better pick up the phone. Hebrews 1, um, verses 1 and 2. i gotta, I got to share this, and then, then I'm going to call it quits. When uh, we're referring here, it says, God, who, uh, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets you notice that in verse 1 there and then look at verse 2 and in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the world uh, don't get confused the last days started when Jesus was born so when we say that these are the last days Yes, it's true, but this is not when they begin. The end of time, the end of life as we know it on earth began when Jesus was born. Because the Son of God, the sacrifice, the Lamb of God was on the scene and it would be fulfilled. And from that time, the end of time, the end of these last, or these last days were already in effect. Amen. So don't think that 
just because we call it the last days that this is the last days. No, it's been ever since Jesus was born. This is the beginning of the last days. However, you and I are totally blessed, and I believe we are the last generation. Uh, I've shared this before, too. If you go back into the history of the Old Testament, you'll see that God walked with his people for 4,000 years. 1,000 years is as unto a, a day. And now we have over 2,000 years since the birth of Christ. Six days. We are in the seventh day. Do you know what the number seven means to God? Completion. So we are. And now as we see these end time events or these last day events starting to uh, and we see them not just starting I mean they are just exploding and uh, the, the time of end is coming and that's why I'm sharing with you as much as I am uh, about this understanding that our relationship with Christ as the bride of Christ is very very important and we need to be focused on Jesus Christ we need to be focused on our bridegroom because he's coming uh, brother Bo, Bo said that from the beginning of time uh, of Christ that the uh, kingdom or this kingdom that was that Jesus will set up here on earth has already been in motion see time is is a, a, a thing with you and I but time is not a thing with God and so that that new kingdom that new rule where Jesus Christ will rule and reign for a thousand years has already been on 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 route it's already coming as just about to get here other than the fact that you remember that it can't take place until first of all there's a taking away of the church because you and I as the body of Christ and the spirit of, of, of God in us uh, Jesus Christ in us we are the ones listen to me listen to me this is why we need to be praying and I mean praying with total um, uh, uh, of everything that was is, is in us we have a, the power to hold Satan back. Because you have relatives, I have relatives that are not saved. And there is time coming when there's going to be many that walk in the, in the, in the um, um, body of Christ who will fall away. It's already happening. Look at the empty seats. called fear my relationship with God is not strong enough to eliminate my fear to where I can walk and have trust in God knowing he's going to take care of me remember what Jesus says that the evil one cannot come near us Jesus said that man take that to heart amen we are the bride of Christ and he is coming for his bride make sure your lamps are full be filling those lamps with the washing of the word knowing who you are in Christ Jesus knowing the promises that belong to you and then walk in them that you can walk into any building I don't care if you're wearing a mask or not me if they won't let me in without a mask I ain't going I don't fear Father we thank you for your love and grace we thank you for the precious precious blood of Jesus Christ I thank you Father that you held nothing back you took all my filth you took all my shame, all my worthlessness, and you placed it on your son, the one who was worth, the one who was of value. He's the one that bore all my sicknesses, diseases, my sin, my sinfulness. And then he turned around and separated the veil from top to bottom so that those of us who believe in what he did 
and who he is, we now have access to Almighty God. We're no longer out in the courtyard. We are in the middle of the throne room of grace, sitting at the feet of our Savior, Jesus Christ, sitting at the feet of the Father, knowing that love and grace is just there for us to just just to hold on to. And, and uh, as I heard one lady last night, there was I just crawled up in his lap. Hmm. I can feel your arms of grace. And you want so much for us all to know that, that grace, know that personal touch. And Father, now I pray over each and every one of us and, and those that are uh, of the household of God, the, the church family, Father, that we will realize and understand who we are in Christ Jesus. Nothing is, nothing should be taken for granted. Throughout your teaching of the Bible, you continually talk about the few. I don't want to be just the few. Father, get this time that we have, let us be those that are going out and sharing and, and strengthening the body of Christ, meeting together in one place in the name of Jesus to lift up and exhort, to worship Almighty God, to praise you and thank you for all that you have done and all you're continuing to do in our lives. Father, let us take time to set time away uh, aside for you. It's not about me. It's about you. Help me to be even more in love with you. I look forward to that day when that trumpet sounds and the bride of Christ is removed from here and we go to a place to meet where our bridegroom will serve us. Why, I don't always understand, but the Bible says that he will serve us in that last supper. Oh, glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We look forward to that day. Help us during this time. Help us with our unbelief. Help us with uh, growing in your word, receiving all the understanding of every situation we get into. There is a way through, and his name is Jesus. And he's already lighted the path. I give you glory. I give you praise. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Um, we're going to do uh, Old Favorite. Y'all like Old Favorite? How great thou art.
and sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art and sings my soul my savior And call me home What joy shall fill my heart Then I will bow In humble adoration And there proclaim My God, how great thou art That is not, that's not just a story. He had the power and the right as the Son of God to call down 10,000. In fact, it says 10 legions. That's actually 78,000 angels, warring angels, to wipe out the entire earth. But he sat there on the cross. It says, forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. And then he died. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen. I speak blessings over you. Have a wonderful week. Just to let you all know, don't forget, it's moving week. And uh, we, we could sure use some help, some helping hands. Um, uh, please. Uh, oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, please, there's going to be, where's Allison? Did she get a clipboard or something? Or Anyway, please take it on your own to find Allison or Pam or Connie over here, and they will uh, show you where to sign up. 
I, I don't care when it is. I'm going to be here tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, and I probably won't be out of here till 10, 11 tomorrow night. And it would be the same thing from now until um, next Saturday. So um, I'll be here. There will always be a need for your help. I don't care if it's only an hour that you can give us. We, we'll take it. And uh, yes, ma'am. We are going to be at our new facility. It is approximately, um, it's about six, seven miles. Oh, four. See, I was, I was stretching it. Four miles from here. Um, and if you write this down, it's called High Desert Station. Now, if you have a smartphone, put it in Google, High Desert Station in Star, Idaho, and it will pop it up. There was a time it wouldn't, but now it do. So, okay, and basically what it is is straight up uh, Middleton or State Highway 44, however you want to call it, uh, until you get to Blessinger Road. And there's that big old barn that sits right there on the corner. That's Blessinger Road. You're going to make a left and go up the hill. And when you get to the top of the hill, you're going to make a right. Okay. You'll see the sign. They have it. They have the signs out there. Go all the way to the end of the road and bear to the left and put you right in there at the, at the uh, equestrian center, and that's what it is. So, like I said, and like people have said that God told them we started in a barn. We're going back to a barn. I, I don't, I don't know. I know you're all excited. Um, I don't know how long that's going to be, uh, because I believe that it's not going to be permanent. Uh, it's only temporal, but at the same time, I know it's going to be a real blessing. Like I said, he's already told me to start packing blankets because it's concrete floors. And he's given me a vision of people just laid out on the floors um, because they're... Mm, if you will follow me, I'll, I'll show you the way to the throne room, and it's going to be up there for a while to where people are going to be called and people are going to be... Uh, moved throughout this valley. I don't know what it was about this where there wasn't the power of God moving here, but it's going to uh, where we're going now, which is, and there again, it's not about the building, it's about you. You are the body of Christ. And so um, I believe that we're going to see such a movement through this body, through this change, uh, that people are going to flock and I say that with all sincerity. They're going to flock like sheep so that they can be a part of what's going to take place as we worship God in our new facility for this time period. So I hope you're going to join us. I hope you're going to be a part of it. And just like I said, also don't forget to invite people and to talk to people, to pray, take the opportunity to pray with people. Um, you know, the Bible says if we don't do it, the rocks will cry out. Well, I'd rather do the talking. I love my Jesus. And as you can tell, I won't put this mic down because I just want to tell you how much I love my Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Yes, ma'am. What time what? Same time as always, 10 o'clock. And we will set up some chairs for, uh, I, I, let me put it this way. We're going to have our service at 10 o'clock. Uh, because we have to set up, tear down, it's not a place where we can go and just leave our stuff. So uh, it's going to be a couple of weeks before we get into a groove and see how things are going to set up um, as far as, uh, like, for example, Frank's morning uh, Bible study at 9 o'clock. I don't know if that's going to happen the first week or two, so bear with us on that. Uh, but we'll keep you up to date on it because, uh, like I said, we're going to haul chairs in. We're going to set them up. I have to set up all the sound equipment. Oh, by the way, I know you're all going to go, oh, no Internet. Told you you are going to say it. <laughs> um, so that means you have to be in church or you won't see it. <laughs> uh, anyway, no, we are going to, we are going to uh, try and work it out to where we – videotape oh thank you where we videotape uh, our service Sunday morning 
and then we will do our best. But at the beginning, it's probably only going to be on YouTube, right? Our YouTube sanctuary, yeah, S Cowboy Church, uh, Facebook, or um, YouTube. So until we get things processed out, it's a it's all new thing. Yes, my love. I was getting there, but thank you, love. And and I'm so glad to have my wife back with me. All week, all week long, I've I've had to go to these meetings and stuff, and and be totally blessed and anointed and everything with the the word and the fellowship and the worship and everything. And my wife had to be at home. She didn't want to share her joy. <laughs> but we thank you all for your prayers. But anyway, praise God. She's healed and back with us. Amen. Okay, so it's High Desert Station. Just so you know, it is, this is the address, 6780 Willis Road. And that's in Star. Okay? So it's only a few miles up the road, but you're changing cities. But, okay, High Desert Station, just put it in Google and it'll lead you right to it. All right? So without further ado, anything else that I have? Oh, yes. Um, but like I said, I need your help, so uh, make sure you sign up. Let me know when you can be here. Uh, when you can't, I know we have people that have limitations and stuff like that, but those people with limitations can pack boxes, and the rest of us mighty men of God will tote them out. So anyway, um, there was something else I wanted to say. <coughs> oh, yeah, my wife said Wednesday. This coming Wednesday, there will be no Wednesday night Bible study because we're moving. Um, so it's too difficult to do everything at one time. So the following Wednesday, which will be the first Wednesday in Sunday, we're there. Wednesday, we're going to be meeting at Gary and Shirley's house. They've graciously opened up their house for us to meet there for our Wednesday night Bible study. And by the way, you're all going, well, we don't know where they live. When you go to the High Desert Station, you pass their house to get to the High Desert Station. Same road. So we'll get you that address, too, and make sure that uh, you all can join us. So that no Wednesday night Bible study this week. We're going to be packing, and, and I don't mean guns. So anyway, y'all, yes? I don't know. Ask my beautiful bride. Eric was going to volunteer his wife, but apparently Eric didn't. Okay, so they're out there. Oh, and my man. All right, Eric's got a word here. While I was sitting here, uh, the Lord just impressed on my heart that there's maybe somebody or some buddies who want to receive Jesus in their life. They're a little yeah. unsure how to do that. Um, they're maybe questioning a bit. Please come and see Pastor Gerald, see me I'm here to lead you to Jesus. Now is the time. Don't delay this. If this is on your heart, please come. Let us walk you to him. Thank you. Amen. Yep, if anybody needs prayer, that's where we're here. <laughs>